My name's Georgie Mosley. I'm here today to talk about my journey as a mum with my little boy, Harry, who had a brain tumour. I hope that from watching Cancer Stories, you can take away something valuable that will help you understand going through your own individual journey. After this maintenance period where things were fairly stable for a while, I think Harry started to have um, headaches. Yes. Uh, not entirely out of the blue, but more frequent. Yeah. And what, what, what happened next? Um, we literally, we were on a day um, out and we travelled miles and miles to go to this skydive event that Harry was watching somebody that he'd become close to. And on the way of the journey, we, I, I was just about to go and pull in for petrol. And Harry said, Mum, I'm going to be sick. And literally, he hadn't felt sick all morning. And he literally opened the door. Luckily, we'd pulled up anyway. And as soon as he said it, he was ill. And then he was OK. And I thought, oh, you know, maybe he'd had some treats. I thought maybe he's, you know, travel sick because it was a long journey. Um, and then he was fine. But, he, you know, throughout, we only went to, turned up for an hour. We then had this long drive home, which he slept the whole way. Headaches were becoming worse, and then the next day he was sick again, you know, and I was thinking, is it a bug, is it... Um, but on the second day, that was it, we rushed him to the hospital and said, look, something not right. Um, you know, uh, we, we knew from the severity the, that there were severe headaches, because Harry just grinned and bared everything. Mm. Um, they examined him, nothing appeared to show um, from the neurological sort of tests that they do. Um, so Harry came home, they thought it was sinusitis. Um, we went home, he was on medication. Um, they monitored him a couple of days later, back in. I think they kept him in overnight. And there was a couple of occasions they kept him in overnight, but the next day sent him home. But then on the third occasion, um, I just knew it was happening, it was becoming more consistent, you know. Um, and they did a, a scan on Harry, a CT scan which had showed um, that he... Well, they hadn't confirmed that his tumour had grown at that point, but they said there was a lot of pressure and basically how he had to have a shunt um, fitted. So they decided to send him home, book him back in for his shunt, um, and he had a shunt fitted, and it seemed to be the best operation ever. How his headaches stopped, sickness stopped, Wow. Harry was laughing yeah. and... Suddenly improved, yeah. Yeah, I was so grateful for that operation, although it did affect his sodium levels, mm -hmm. so they wouldn't release him from hospital because they were becoming dangerously low. Um, and this was July 2011, um, and then Harry sadly didn't get to come home before they'd realised that when they did the shunt and they had the scan, that... The fluid and the pressure that was building up in Harry's brain was because Harry's tumour had grown and blocked off where your fluid drains down. Yeah. So they had, didn't know why Harry's tumour had suddenly started to grow. Um, he'd started on growth hormones and things, but he only had those for a week because we always thought, well, is it that that's caused, you know? Mm. But we don't know. It started anyway after three years and... They said that the only option then for Harry, because he was becoming, he was sleeping, so, you know, he was sleeping for 14 hours, 17 hours a day. But when he woke up, he was still Harry. Mm. Cheery face, jokes across the ward and poems <laughs> to all the nurses. Um, and he was just his bubbly self. So, it was, again, it was hard to grasp that once again, where things are so serious. Mm. Um, but they said the only option for Harry was to have his surgery, mm. um, because... He couldn't have his chemotherapy again. Mm -hmm. It hadn't worked. Um, and obviously, he couldn't have radio again. So they booked Harry in. Um, and the 10th of August, he went down for surgery. And and at that point, you know, we'd been in hospital for three weeks. And we were on a neurosurgical ward, so not your typical cancer ward. So many kiddies coming in during that time going down for, you know, whether it's a brain tumour and they're having it removed or other 
um, you know, head surgery. And every one of them, it was almost like it didn't appear so serious mm. because they all came straight back to the ward, but to a, a and at the end of the ward that was for those like recovery. And yes, they were groggy and sleepy, and you know they had, you know, a high level of care for that time for about a week or so, and that you could start to gradually see them all getting better. Mm. It sort of took away the seriousness mm, of mm, actually mm. this is. Um, um, and it was during that time that Harry, who had started his own little campaign, he met a little girl there, and she was only 18 months old, and she'd been down for brain surgery, and he had to walk past the intense uh, recovery part mm-hmm. to go to the toilet. And he came back to, to the bed crying, and, he, and I said, Harry, what's over the matter, you know, thinking he'd got a headache? And he said, Mum, he said, this is why I do what I do. He said, you know... Um, and that impacted on Harry so much, seeing that child that was smaller than him. And I thought, to me, it showed how remarkable Harry was because yes. he was still a little boy. Yeah. He was 11 at this time. Yeah. Um, and he was having to go ahead and face that. And he understood and saw how they were coming back and he knew what was coming. Mm. Um, mm. And the 10th of August came, and on the morning, um, I obviously remember it vividly, it was when all the riots were on in Birmingham, um, and uh, you know, you looked out the window, we got parents the night before, you know, we couldn't get Harry's granddad to the hospital because there was all this commotion, mm, obviously mm. outside in the city. But on the morning of his surgery, he, the anaesthetist came round and said, right, Harry, we're going to get you gowned up, we're going to take you down to theatre is there anything you're allergic to? And Harry said, yeah, hospitals and girls. <laughs> <laughs> and that, you know, to me, that was, um, even on the morning, he knew. But as we wheeled him down to the theatre, you know, we did say, Mum, I'm, I'm scared. And Harry had always had, uh, he used to often have dreams that he was going to have surgery. Mm. Um, and he, he wouldn't wait, he, he, you know, he wouldn't live. Mm. Um, and we used to be like, no, you can't have surgery. It's, you know, it's inoperable. And then he did, you know. Mm. And he, he, for us, his his operation was supposed to be for four or five hours, um, and it was to debulk the tumour. Mm. They could never remove all of it because of where it was. Yeah. But we tried to give Harry the positivity that after he'd gone through that and he'd have a week of being groggy but we would be by his side mm. that his tumour would be the smallest it's ever been since we knew he'd got it. Mm. Um, and, you know, and that was what we clung on to. Whatever you, we faced along the journey, the chemo, the radio, the ups and downs, the house, we, we were just looking for closure and, mm. um, you know, and for Harry being as well as he could. Um, but the four hours, you know, they sat us on the bed space that they were going to bring Harry back to, and we just paced up and down and watched the clock and kept walking to buy the theatre doors and, um, yeah, longest four hours ever. Except that four hours turns into six, seven, mm-hmm. eight, mm-hmm. nine, ten. And it was more 11. complicated than yeah. they realised. Well, we didn't have any communication during that. Um, I think as well, I was one of these that's probably too scared to ask Mm -hmm. and I just thought maybe they're getting rid of more of it. Mm -hmm. Maybe the longer that they're in there, the more of the tumours go in, you know. Um, And then eventually we had, um, you know, there was Harry's grandparents, there was his brother and sister, there was me and my husband. um, And we had the doctors come and tell us that um, Harry had undergone a big hemorrhage during his operation and for him... He had to go to uh, ICU, mm, yeah, yeah. supposedly just to give his body a rest. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, but again, you know, you cling on to the, and this is why I don't like fluffiness, you know, tell us how it is. Mm. Um, because we were, for us, we were under the impression that it literally was, he'd been through a lot and he needed a rest from it all. And 
that's literally all it was. And we went walked into obviously we, we had to wait again for probably about another half an hour, an hour while they got Harry ready and they sedated him and incubated him. Um and uh yeah, to walk in and see him. That was hard, I'm sure. Especially as up to that point you'd waited all those hours not knowing the outcome. Um, yes. But in your mind, seeing the children on the ward do okay. And um, it was the first you'd heard that the outcome wasn't, wasn't what you expected. Yeah, it was uh, hard to take in, you know, and also for his brother and sister. To, to see him go through that was just, um, it was awful. Hmm. And once again, you know, you're back going through the, the treatment journey and I refused to leave him. So, um, yeah, we, me and my husband that night, we sat in a chair at his bedside and grandparents step in and, you know, the kiddies went home. And, but three, four days after, you know, they said, right, we're going to wake Harry up. And instantly me and my husband thought, wow, he's going to, you know, they're going to stop the treatment and straight away he's going to suddenly, you know, over the course of the day. And um, it just didn't happen. But then once they'd reduced him off the ventilation and he was breathing for himself, we were so relieved that we thought, this is it. We've been through the nightmare mm. and things are now going to get better and better because they told us they'd remove what they thought was 50% of Harry's tumour. Mm. So we thought, here we go. He's out, he's out of the danger now. And we were actually just ecstatic, even though Harry hadn't woken up, that mm. we were going on to the ward. And however long that journey took, we knew he was on an uphill yeah. um, journey. Um Sadly, that wasn't, you know, for us, that wasn't the case. Um, mm -hmm. And cutting a very long story short, you know, Harry started to, although he was still asleep and in a coma, um, he started to, what we thought was to wake up because he'd say, Harry, blow me a kiss or pucker up, because that's what I always used to say to him. And he'd, you know, his lips would come out or Harry, the doctor's here, you know, thumbs up or give us a high five and he'd do it. But within seven to ten days, all of that stopped. He wasn't responding unless you vividly shook on his chest. Um, and his GCS scores were just um, deteriorating. Um, but at that time, I felt like nobody would listen. And I found it the most frustrating because even though I'm not a medical professional, I'm Harry's mum. And I could tell. I sat by his bedside for the whole four months that we were in hospital from when he was first, you know, sent in. Um, and all, you know, and it can be a very lonely time and all I did was watch and wait and, um, yeah. But the fact that Harry responding, the doctors were trying to get across to me that the fact he was responding, he was still responding. Mm. But you didn't have to vividly rub his chest at first, you mm. know. He would just do it. If he just said it two or three times, it was there. And at the end, um, eventually, three weeks after his operation, they took him back down for a scan. Um, and that scan revealed that um, the morning we thought we'd got good news. Uh, he had his scan and the following morning, the consultants came round to do their round. And they said, yeah, all's positive and, you know, we'll tell you. You know, it all went well and as expected. And then a couple of hours later, and I always remember it because I was sat on the edge of the bed. My husband had come up with the kids and his neurosurgeon came round to see us and said, oh, has Harry, you know, started talking yet? Has he opened his eyes? And we said, no. And I said, you know, we're really concerned. It's been three weeks and he's still not awake. And every other child that we, we were judging Harry's recovery on it, what we'd seen. And he said, yeah, I'm a little concerned too which, you know, from one minute of the doctors that morning picking you up, even though they didn't go into detail of, yeah, everything's good, to then saying, well, actually, no. Um, you know, the scans revealed that the tumour that we've removed has grown back and then some more. I had to get my husband to sort of pinch me because, you know, that you'd, we'd, and we were actually then, because we'd been told good news on the morning, 
we were doubting whether he'd actually got the wrong scan results mm, and, mm, and because mm. we're clinging on to hope. I can understand that. Um, and then our world fell apart, you know, because you just think, what next? Mm. And, you know, and the constant just praying for Harry to wake up. And... But I think I sort of sensed it because I knew that something was happening mm. inside. And the hardest bit in all of that time is the fact that Harry couldn't tell us, mm. you know, mm. he couldn't. Um, and I just wanted to get him out of there. I just wanted to take him home and care yeah. for him at home. And mm. Mm. was learning, obviously, all the NG food uh, feeding. It's complicated, um, isn't it? But were you allowed yeah. to do that? Yeah, eventually they yeah. showed me and then I used to feed Harry. Yeah. I just wanted, as his mum, the bits that I could do. Yes. I wanted to do. Yeah, that's you know? totally fair. The bath in the care, the change in his pads and... Mm feeding him you know uh, I'd have done it all if I could but mm. um, yeah it was important to me and then after that we were just watching and waiting all the time mm. and then it went on for um, you know another four weeks and then uh, we got to it being close to ten weeks and then Harry the one night he'd been and had a scan because he kept on raising his left arm like mm. this mm. Um, and groaning and I flew out the first time it happened I flew out to put Harry into isolation because he kept having a really bad tummy and also because I'd had to start him on oral chemotherapy again because obviously being in a coma he couldn't cope with the intensive so um, when he started doing this I flew out the door and said look what's happening is he waking up is he in pain um, and we didn't know and then they again Harry had another scan and it showed that Harry had got um, blood clots um, which were just stemming and running down and I imagine that they didn't stop there and it just seemed like every time there was bad news and we got we clung on to the hope because the hope of um, the chemo was that the chemo they were giving him vincristine would target the blood vessels which feed the tumour for us that was hope, mm. that's good mm. get it in him, you know, mm. give him that and mm. hopefully it will crush what, whatever's happening and feeding his tumour. And then it was like another problem and it was just, it felt like the doors were closing on Harry. Mm. But at this time, even his consultant knew, his oncologist consultant, that Harry was still Harry behind mm. it. Mm -hmm. um, so we were very careful in terms of talking in the room in front of Harry, whether he could leave. We just didn't know and that was, that was the hardest part of him, not knowing we were there or not. Mm. Mm. And then after we'd had these results again about his blood clots and um, they couldn't give him a certain drug, I think it was called Wolf. Wolfrin. Yeah. It's for the... Um, it was that's like basically for clots. Yeah, for they couldn't give him that because of his... For the hemorrhage, it would be a contraindication. Yeah, it could was make just... Worse. Absolutely. It's a catch-22 medically, yeah. if you like. Yeah, and I think it was something called Clexane, if I remember right, that they were giving into his leg. and Yeah, a new um, anti-platelet drug, I think that is. Yeah, to try and disperse, you know, and, and move them. Um, but within that, it was just like, I think at that point, it was almost like Harry had had enough that day. Mm. And... Once again, his breathing had stopped, and uh, sorry, not stopped, but his breathing was suffering, and they kept putting him on more oxygen and more oxygen, and eventually we ended up back down in um, ICU where they ventilated him again and sedated him, and and everything. You know, it, it seems like. We were fine, you know, that morning before that happened, we were sat round a table, about 10 doctors, occupational health, physiotherapists, mm. because we were just so desperate to get home, because mm. I just wanted to give him the very best care. I promised him mm. Mm. that we'd get him home, and, um, and me and my husband and his brother and sister were just going to look, you know, look after Harry, obviously mm. with nurses coming in for the even whilst he was in his coma in a week to the day. Just such a different story. Um, Harry 
after a few days of being in intensive care, they decided to get a neurologist to have a look at Harry, and he'd never had one before. Mm. And he did a EEG with mm-hmm. the stickers all over his head. Yeah. And it was actually from that. Um, we'd actually got in the room at the time after that. Um, a special visitor would come to see Harry, mm. and he sat at the bedside with me. And the the consultant in ICU said, "Look, Harry's got no brain activity whatsoever, mm. um, and there is no chance that it will recover." Um, she said, "However, we are going to try something, and I don't know what it was called, but they basically gave him class A drugs." But she made it very clear to me, and my husband. We have to see a continual improvement in Harry. Mm, mm, she said, mm. I'm not, she said, day one, mm. we need to see mm, him mm. start to stir, open his eyes. Day two, he needs to be doing that and then some more. And she was very, very harsh the way she delivered it and very, to make it very clear. But I, for the first time in all the fluffiness, I appreciated her direct, mm. this is how it is. And for the first time, I understood. And some people might think, wow, you know, if he's in ICU, things are pretty bad. Mm. But when you're told, oh, we've just given his body a rest and da da da, da you can't understand how serious it sort of is because yeah. you just trust and believe. And, um, and they tried it, so it started on the Wednesday, and they said, we're given three days, and if we don't see continuous improvement for three days, you know, that's. There is nothing more. And I could actually tell that Harry was not Harry anymore. And I can see it now with the photos I've got when I look at Harry. Um, I knew that he'd, he'd gone, or his brain had gone. Mm-hmm. Um, and he didn't... He didn't, he didn't make any progress on that uh, final measure. First day, as soon as they gave him straight away, you know, yeah. and me and my husband just sat there watching and yeah. trying to encourage him to yeah. wake up. Mm. And he didn't. And then we, had, we just said enough, because it was mm. just... He'd had so many things and, you know, going into his arteries and mm-hmm. it was just covered in... Br- he just had enough and I just said... Enough. And then we had to, we had to make arrangements to uh, fulfil Harry's dream and get him home. So uh, the hospital was just fantastic, and you know, from the minute that that was the call, then everybody just flew around. Um, on phones, doctors, nurses, consultants, you know, Macmillan nurses, mm. just trying to help us get Harry home. Um, so his last wish was to be at home in those last few We'd days. never discussed dying, we never ever thought Harry would, you know, he went in to hospital obviously appearing okay in himself, yeah. he was witty even the morning of his surgery and mm. for us when he went down for surgery that's when we lost him really. Mm. Okay. Um, you know, we didn't get Harry back. We mm. never had a conversation after that. Mm. That was it. Mm. And uh, they all did a wonderful job. And then on the Thursday night, me and my daughter, um, I stayed in ICU anyway. I just refused to leave Harry. So I just stayed in an armchair and my daughter stayed too. And, we just got Harry ready to come home. And then they, you know, we had an ambulance and uh, although I think Harry's, they were really worrying because in the morning, Harry was on maximum ventilation and they said, look, we need to get him home quick. Um, and there was a worry that we wouldn't get him home at all. Um, so they brought the ambulance forward an hour and we, uh, yeah, when me and Harry went home, and they put Harry into, obviously we got a special bed at home for him. And they thought that once they removed the ventilator at home that he'd die within an hour, but we actually, he got his wish and he had the last night at home and he died probably 36 hours later. 
which was which was hard, you know, to watch and um, to understand. And but you know, you know, we were there, and his brother and sister lay on his bed, and he died in my arms. But then, for me, I'd still got a Harry, mm. even though the following morning. You know, the nurses came out and we were pretty much on our own on during the Saturday daytime because we wanted to be. Mm-hmm. Once we got Harry set up on his syringe driver and removed his ventilator and everything else, we um, we just wanted to be a family. So we knew we could call them. They were amazing, the nurses, if we needed anything. And when Harry died, we phoned them not long after and said that Harry had gone. And they turned up. And then we were able to stay with Harry at home. Or Harry was able to stay at home until the following morning, obviously when the funeral directors had to come and collect him um, and take him to Acorns. Looking back on that whole period, that period where he was in ITU and um, you weren't quite sure you know, whether he was going to pick up, you saw the other children improving... Do you think there was anything else that could have been done or were you satisfied that with everyone involved that things were handled as well as they could be at that time? Yeah, um, I was. There was a couple of occasions where I felt that um, some of the consultants should have listened. It wouldn't change the outcome at Mm. all. Mm. Because you were noticing his deterioration first, weren't you? I knew. I just knew. Yeah. Other nurses knew, and other nurses were calling the consultants in the middle, and I could hear the nurses talking about it, mm. you know. But ultimately, did they did their best for Harry? But Harry was still on this neurosurgical ward, and mm. once they'd, once they knew that he'd had his surgery, and obviously the tumour had grown back, it was too risky for them to operate on Harry again. Yeah. But they wanted the the neurosurgical team, because obviously the beds are very valuable, I understand that. They wanted to move Harry onto the cancer ward. Mm. But for me, you know, and I expressed my views that, look, when Harry came in, he was awake. He's only known this ward. He's got to know voices of all the nurses. He's in a very dark place. He's not awake. He's got familiarity by staying on this ward. And also by moving him, even though he's now on chemotherapy... By moving him onto a cancer ward, mm. those cancer nurses specialise in what they do. They're not trained if Harry suddenly develops something as a result of brain surgery. Mm. I can understand that. Um, so we thought to keep out, you know, and did, they did, they kept him on there, but I don't know, maybe it's me. I did feel sometimes that Harry was, you know, forgotten because he didn't have a voice. He couldn't say, ah, I'm in pain, or oh, mm. I need this doing, or... It's hard in those later stages when yeah. the communications are becoming more impaired anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah, his own... And I just felt such relief every time Harry's own consultant, the oncologist, was walked into that ward mm. because I felt safe, mm. you know, and I mm. felt that he honestly listened to everything mm. that I said. And also... Um, the endocrinologist doctor was consultant, has, yes. uh, which looked after all his growth and hormone yeah, sure. side. They knew I wasn't a panicky mom, you know, um, and they knew when I said something that it was because I was genuinely disturbed. I wasn't being nervous about the situation, mm. but I'd, you know, I tried to encourage everything for Harry to wake up. You know, mm. as every parent would in that situation, it's. Um, but just and some just just some levels of care, you know. I could spot any nurse that had been through the same journey, yeah, that had lost a child or been through cancer, yeah, could spot them a mile away mm. because the level of care was so just stood out a sure. mile, you know. And sometimes it's just that, you know, when people forget and they think that a chart is just a chart and this is just a, you know, and it's not things that are, you know 
want to go into now, but those charts are there for a reason and scores and things are there and need to be accurate for a reason because they feed the information to the mm. um, neurosurgeons and oncologists and, uh, yeah, you know, communication, empathy is everything. And, and it helps you through that, you know, it's not a, a patient, it, it's a person, mm. you know. Yeah, that's still um, important to remember yeah. that for everyone, isn't it? Absolutely, and that person, you know, it's whether they're awake or in a coma, you know, they've got they've got feelings, and the family around them have also got a lot of, you know, that person is somebody's the the life to somebody else, you know, that they're whether it's their parents, their wife, their husband. Um, so I just, yeah, but you know, ultimately everything with Harry all the doctors, all the teams, and it opens your eyes to the amount of people that are involved in such a journey, not just cancer, but anything. Because you don't know until you've been through something. Mm. And they were all amazing and did their very best for Harry. And, yeah, a few areas that, from our own journey, we learn from, but we always do, but it wouldn't have changed the outcome for Harry. Georgie, I want to ask you about uh, what happened after Harry passed in 2011. It was October, I think, 2011. Yes. Um, what, what was the impact on you as a family? Because you had that really intense period, getting even more intense right up to the end, um, where your routines really, you tried to hold on to them, but let's be honest, they were significantly affected by mm. the illness. And then suddenly um, things have changed again. How do you how do you manage then as a family? Um, straight away after Harry passed away, you know, the, for us, it was then right. What's next? Which was Harry's funeral, and that was the focus. And to me, I knew that. I think we were all a little bit shocked. Couldn't understand it, even though he died in my arms, and I knew he died. I could still see him. I could still touch him. I could still love him. Mm. Talk to him. And I knew for me it would be the day that we had his funeral that however I would react, I would react. Mm. <laughs> you know, I didn't know. Um, but I still felt like I got Harry. Dead or alive, he was still here. Um, and then we started all the funeral planning and obviously wanted to give Harry the best send-off that we could. He mm. deserved it, you know. He'd done so much in the last two years of his life for other people. And it was actually only when Harry died that a lot of people stepped forward and said he did so much and Harry was amazing and Mm, da 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 mm, and I mm, thought mm. Harry had absolutely no idea of the impact that he's had on other people because of who he'd helped and what he was trying to achieve. So we decided to have a, a funeral for Harry that was, the first ceremony was public so anybody that thought anything of Harry mm-hmm. or was inspired mm-hmm. by Harry could attend took a followed straight on to a very private family mm. a small um, one yeah yeah a service and we were just I think that focused because again that gave us a purpose to get up every day and to get this done yes. and this day was about Harry and you know and in it I did a reading my daughter did a reading and um a lot of people said, don't, we don't know how you got through it as a family, but for me, I'll always say as a mum, the day was about Harry, it wasn't mm. about mm. me. Mm. It wasn't about my feelings, mm. it was about my son mm. uh, and my best friend, yeah. that the day just had to be the best that we could achieve for him, you know, and that's all I kept thinking in my head, mm. you know, it's t- this is about him, mm. uh, it's, you know, it's not about how you feel and what you've lost and... Mm. Um, but I knew, and I did, and, you know, afterwards, obviously, we had a wake after. But, boy, was I dreading going home. Mm. Because that was the first time. Although Harry had been at, um, you know, Acorns Hospice in a special bedroom, he'd, yeah. he'd not been at home. Mm. We were there as often as we could, and we were busy with the funeral arrangements. And it was almost like, you know, you get home, and it's like he's upstairs in bed. Yeah. But we knew it was going to be different, so mm. I stayed at that wake as long as I could, and mm. I drunk as much as I could. And in the end, you know, my husband and 
the kids, we sort of had to drag each other and, and go mm. home. Yeah, because that's when you really notice the gap. Yeah. And it's for all of you, really, as well. Yeah. Um, and it had been a whirlwind, you know. We'd been away. I'd been away from home for four months. Mm. Um, mm. And we'd just not... I think we were just all out of everything by that point. And, uh, you know, we just didn't want to go out, didn't want to do anything. And Harry's funeral was just before the half-term holidays. Mm. The kids had got some time and they were trying to get normality. My son was still going out with his friends and I wanted them to do that, you know. Um, and people grieve in different ways. And I still say, I think two and a half years on, I don't think because of the response from Harry's passing mm -hmm. that we've had, you know, um, which I'm thankful for because it's given me a purpose every day. Mm. I don't think we've had that chance to grieve mm. for Harry, you know. It's uh, probably, you know, as a mum or a dad should. It's It's been a whirlwind, it's been a roller coaster. it's been very, very busy mm. and we've thrown everything into it mm. because of the hurt, because of the anger, because of the impact of the journey on our lives routine, lifestyle, finances, you know, how family members are affected by it. And it's the little things that um, hurt you the most, you know. Um, I think we've all, and speaking for my husband, you know, we've separated 12 months after Harry passed away. My family, you know, I've got a beautiful photo of the five of us about a week before Harry went into hospital. And the genuine happy smiles that we've all got then. You know, and when I think of the five of us now, and it will always be the five of us, there's just a split. You know, my daughter lives with me, my older son lives with his dad. Mm. And we're still very, I'm very close with both mm. of the children mm. and st still speak to the dad, but. Um, Dad's are as important as mum's. My son's 17 and he yes. said, well, mum, if Danny's with you, I'm going to stay with Dad. And quite rightly so. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, it's impacted on absolutely everything. And, you know, I carry on with the Harry's work. And I think because people locally see my face a lot, mm. they think that that's resulted in lifestyle and things change. But cancer will have an impact on me till the day that I die mm. Um, mm. and the rest of our family you know my kids had their childhood ripped away because all they remember is cancer um, and I just hope that if there is a God that he will now not in terms of materialistic things but in terms of health and I just hope they smile lots as adults <laughs> he owes me that at least <laughs> um, but this is why now, you know, I do what I do in the in the carry on with Harry's work and all mm. that he created to mm. hopefully mm. to help other people and try and prevent what I can put a stop to. Yes. Now, um, one of the reasons I was asking you about the problems or issues that occurred during the journey was one, it's very valuable to hear any direct feedback, but two, you have started to be um, in a position where you can actually feed back in a more in a way that's listened to and you might even have ideas that can change the way we deal with difficult issues either of people young people becoming unwell or how they cope with their illness or how the families survive all that pressure mm -hmm. um, you know there's lots there's lots that we can learn and there's other you know there's hundreds of people nationally who are being put in a similar situation that you were in back then mm -hmm. so that once, in a way, it leads me to ask this question about how did um, some of the positive aspects come out of all of this? How did um, Harry start to do that work? Harry's story is like anything in life. If you work hard enough, you don't give up and you're determined. It doesn't matter who you are, you can, you can achieve and get the end result. And Harry proved that, you know, he was a little boy from a council estate that proved that regardless of your age, your wealth, your lifestyle, your well-being, if you care about something so passionately enough, you can achieve it as long as you don't give up. And Harry didn't. 
He met a man at the hospital who was inspired by him. He became friends with him and when he heard that his friend who was a 55 year old man, Robert Harley, was very poorly with his brain tumour a couple of years after, when Harry was nine, in 2009, Harry said, Mum, I've got to do something. Harry at the age of nine knew enough wasn't being done for people going through cancer. And that is why he decided to start his campaign to help others mm. um, in his situation because he didn't want anybody to... He wanted to find a cure to get Robert better mm. and he didn't want anybody to go through, you know, what we as a family were going through. Do you think by getting involved in that sense that he actually had... Uh, it helped him with his journey? In a mm. sense, he had a kind of mission which he was trying to help others as well. Oh, absolutely. Mm. Harry thrived off it, you know, the more... And obviously, as any parent, when your child comes up with an idea, you encourage them, you support them. Mm. But sometimes you might not think he's not going to do it to become what he did in the end. Mm. We just thought, oh, yeah, I'll sell a few bracelets around his friends and around mm. his family <laughs> and, and that'll be it. He'll, be, he'll get bored and he'll move on and there'll be some, <laughs> something else. Mm. But obviously, we supported him and he just... As soon as he did that, it was like, right, I need somebody else to sell them to. I know, I'll take them into school. And then he went into school and he went, right, I need every school doing it. I need to go and tell my story in different schools, Mum. So he started going, you know, and he didn't plan for his campaign to be up there when he passed away. Mm. He just, with hard work, dedicated, not giving up, mm. coming up with different idea, mm, ideas, mm, mm, mm. he persevered. Yeah. And was he doing all this work in that maintenance phase I described earlier? Yes. Of that three years when yeah. he was relatively stable? In 2009, right up until the day he was admitted to hospital hmm. um, in July 2011. Um, and even then he took beads into hospital and he was selling his bracelets on the ward. Um, and for the little kids he was giving them out, but for everybody else he was selling them to the nurses. Um, but other than that, you know, he couldn't do anything... Um, Harry was supposed to do a very big speech that day for another cancer charity when, when he was in hospital. And because he couldn't do it, he did um, like a script to yeah. apologise and mm. explain why he couldn't be there because he felt like he was letting people down. Mm. Um, and that's the little boy that he was, you mm. know. And um, yeah, it's just. It's a kind of confluence of talents in a sense that he's driven. He's got the experience. Yeah. He's meeting other people that are infecting, affecting him. Yes. So he wants to give back. Yeah. But he's also generous and he's got a certain talent to see things through. Yeah. All of those things have to come together in yeah. order to make a big difference. Yeah, and he did, you know. He, he did a lot of local things like sitting outside your supermarkets all weekend, you know. And you just think, what at the time, what nine-year-old or 11-year-old boy would do that? <laughs> you know mm. but he loved it he loved talking to the old people mm. that came up and his regular customers and he did he, he enjoyed company more off adults than he did with mm. children mm. and I think again that cancer journey the way it matured him he enjoyed adult company he was very much an adult head on a you know a little body really mm. um and you know but it, nothing would phase him whether it was outside a supermarket or whether you know he'd write off and through the love of Twitter, you know, he got onto Twitter, mm. started just talking to people, and people loved his positivity. Mm. He was then doing poems with everybody. And because of that, he got himself in front of the CEO of Virgin Media in London and about 200 members of staff, you know, went in for a board meeting um, with them after his speech. He blew them all away, and I thought oh, he was going to need some support here, and I walked into the meeting room with him, and he went, no, you're all right, Mum. I'm fine, thanks. <laughs> and left me outside this glass building, you know, peering through, thinking, oh, I hope he's all right, you know, because I look at him and think, that's my baby in that chair, and he's lounged back in his little baseball cap and just chatting to the board of directors at, at Virgin Media. And he loved it, he thrived off it. And I think the, the beautiful, the innocence of being a child. Mm, of course. Um, and all that they know through a journey is what helps them through, I think. Lots of kids that go through that cancer journey are very much Harry. They might not do fundraising like Harry did, but they still have that same outlook. Yes. And... Well, I wanted to come on to that because people who might watch this video might be 
mums, family members, but they might be young people as well, suffering or diagnosed, newly diagnosed. Yeah. Is there anything that you can say to those people who be watching, who be in an earlier position, who yeah. might feel they'd like to do something, but they're not sure what to do. They'd like to be able to cope with their condition, but yeah. they're not terribly sure what services are around. What would you say to those young people who are now newly diagnosed? Live for every, every moment, enjoy every day, and while you have the ability to do things, because sometimes the treatment can make you groggy and poorly, but if you wake up today and you can smile and you have energy, you make the most of every day. As Harry will say, you know, you put the can into cancer. Um, smile lots, laugh lots, and always focus on the positives. Don't dwell on the fact of, what, you know, the label that you've been given and what you've got. You know, for me, God forbid, you know, I haven't been there, but I will always, if ever I had cancer, I'd still might see myself as Georgie, not Georgie with cancer. Um, you know, and that's hard for me to say because I've only been there to support my son. Yeah. But I think you're just always in life, whatever the journey, you always, you know, if you dwell and worry about the negatives in your life, it can eat you up yeah. and it can take you to a very bad place yeah so, so focus on the good focus that's... on the positive now i want to ask you if you have any advice for families i'm talking about parents here yeah, who are seeing their youngster newly diagnosed struggling with symptoms that you know then they find strange scary um they don't know what journey is ahead it could be a long one they could mm. they could have a cure you know it's quite possible a lot of yeah. people do get a cure, um, but that doesn't mean to say the emotional journey is not difficult. Yeah. Um, any advice to parents in that position? To any parents that, that children have just been diagnosed, you know, I'd just say that you have to get on with whatever is thrown at you. Um, you know, it's a whirlwind, it's a roller coaster of emotions. If you've got people that you can talk to, talk to them. Um, open up. If not, find people that you can talk to and connect to. Um, if you've got any questions, make sure you ask them. Don't think that they're silly. You know, if you can fire something at your consultant or the team that's looking after your child and you want to know, you have a right to know. Um, but again, you know, focus on the, the end goal mm -hmm. of getting your child better. Mm. It's going to throw some nasty you know, crossroads, yes. yeah, absolutely at you, <coughs> that you've got to go through, mm -hmm. sadly, like the chemo, like radio, like surgery, but never lose hope, um, you know, until, if ever, and God forbid, hopefully it's not so many people get through it and recover and get a new sense of normality, but you've just got to keep, you know, keep going and, and cling on to every aspect of hope that you've got and, and the, the goal, you know. But Georgie, that's really brilliant advice. Um, I know there's a whole range of people out there who might watch this, but um, people who particularly in a similar position to you will find this quite emotional, but one that I think is also valuable because it's tempting to focus on some of the things that go wrong and get, feel you're stuck with those. But um, by trying to push through things as a family and trying to must the support from all avenues. It, it helps the journey, you know, by asking for help, like you say, um, rather than just accepting the situation. So yeah. being proactive is another tip that people can Definitely. take away. Georgie, I want to thank you for coming in today to share your story with us and also all the viewers. It's been a really a tremendous account. I know a lot of people might think they know what's happened with Harry from the internet and the foundation, but in truth, you've also been through a personal journey and everyone in your family has with yeah. what's happened to Harry. Because of course, cancer is not just affecting that individual, it's affecting everyone around them, isn't it? And what you've told today is a very clear, but emotional account, valuable account of um, what, you've, what, you, what you've been through. And it's one that the viewers are definitely think will find helpful. So thanks for sharing Thank your story you. and I, I wish you all the best. Thank you. With all your good work. Thank you. <laughs>